Hi there, Allison Scobart here, Consolidated Planning Group. We are excited to be back uh, with Sarah Kendall from the Texas Workforce Commission. And today we are gonna be talking about understanding Title II disability and work, how work affects these benefits. Um, um, we're no stranger uh, to Sarah Kendall. She has presented with us uh, in the past. If you've missed those presentations, um, we have the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel and our past presentations on SSI, Social Security Disability, Childhood Disability Benefits. They all live on the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to that for free. Um, from a housekeeping perspective today, I would just like to mention that we are in webinar mode today. And what that means is that we can't see you or hear you, but we know you're there, and we're glad you're here with us today. We invite you um, to put your questions in the chat box today. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box for Sarah and we'll be answering as many questions as we can. Today's presentation is being recorded um, and everyone that is registered for today's webinar will get a copy of the slides as well as a link to the recording. If you are listening in uh, to this on a podcast, uh, you can email us directly at contact at cpgcares.net and, re and request a copy of the slides, or you can call us at 281-690-1177. That's 281-690-1177, and we will be happy to give you a copy of today's slides. Um, CPG, Consolidated Planning Group, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We have over 30 years of experience. We are a advisory and consulting firm nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. We help families just like yours plan for the future of their loved one with a disability. We um, solve, um, you know, answer questions like, how much do I need to fund a special needs trust? Who's gonna care for my child when I'm gone? We help people open up ABLE accounts. We do a lot of advocacy by way of our webinars and um, we stand ready to help you when it comes to planning for your loved ones. So having said that, I know we've got a lot of information uh, to go over today. So Sarah, thank you so much for being back with us. Uh, let's dive into um, Title II disability benefits and how working affects that. Thank you again for being here. Absolutely, and thank you for inviting us. We love to spread the word that people who receive benefits based on disability from the Social Security Administration can go to work and even earn a living wage. So that's really important. There are three types of Social Security Administration disability benefit programs. Last month for Consolidated Planning Group, we covered Supplemental Security Income. This month, we're going to cover Title II. And then on March 5th, again, for Consolidated Planning Group, we're going to do the concurrence. Those are people who receive both Title II and Supplemental Security Income. But today, we're going to concentrate just on Title II. Next slide. So the most important thing, or one of the most important things to know about Title II disability benefits is the term substantial gainful activity. It is really the building block for everything that happens with Title II disability benefits. And substantial gainful activity is an amount of money that Social Security uses to measure the level of work activity someone's doing. And the work activity someone's doing is, that's the gross monthly earnings from a job. That's what substantial gainful activity is. This year, in 2024, substantial gainful activity is $1,550 gross earnings a month for those who are not statutorily blind by Social Security's definition or $2,590 gross earnings a month for those who are statutorily blind by Social Security's definition. The important thing to know about any of the numbers that you hear today that I talk about is that all those numbers can change each January 1st. If there's a cost of living adjustment in the United States, then these numbers will change every January 1st. So you wanna be sure and look at Social Security's website every year to find out what the new numbers are. Um, because you may have made a determination that your child, you want to keep your child under substantial gainful activity. Um, and if you've made that determination and you have, you have all the information, that's fine. Um, but you don't want to artificially keep them under a lower number than they could be working. So these numbers usually go up every year. 
Um, excuse me, individuals earning substantial gainful activity. If you could go back to the last slide, sorry, I have a frog in my throat. Let's get that frog out there. Um, folks who are earning substantial gainful activity who apply for a Title II disability benefit will not get it because Title II disability benefits are really all about working. How much can you work? How much can you earn? Um, and substantial gainful activity becomes extremely important if you receive a Title II benefit based on disability. And we'll talk about that a little more. One thing I do want to tell you is the information I'm giving you today is a very broad overview of Title II disability benefits. There's a lot of devil in the details with Social Security programs, um, and that's true for Title II. So today is a very broad overview, hopefully showing you how people can go to work when they receive a Title II disability benefit and retain either their cash benefit um, but definitely retain their Medicare. So the Title II disability benefit programs are insurance programs. They are for those over the age of 18 who have worked and paid into the Federal Insurance Contribution Act or Self-Employment Contribution Act when they worked, or it, they might be someone who's related to someone who has paid into FICA or SICA. And that money, that Federal Insurance Contribution Act or the Self-Employment Contribution Act, part of those taxes go into two different trust funds, the Old Age and Survivor Trust Fund and the Disability Insurance Trust Funds. The Old Age and Survivor Trust Funds is where we draw our retirement from, and the Disability Insurance Trust Funds are where these disability programs, that money comes from those trust funds, and those are national trust funds. So Title II is, again, for those over age 18 who have worked and earned enough credits, and they also have to have a recent work history, and they have to have worked for a specific period of time. Um, they have to have acquired a disability, or they have a disability that's worsened. And whether they acquire the disability or their disability worsened, that condition means that they're unable to earn or continue to earn substantial gainful activity. That's how you get onto Title II. So you have to have enough credits. You have to have a recent work history. You have to work for a specific period of time. And you have to be unable to earn or continue to earn over substantial gainful activity. Or you might be somebody who's related to someone who has paid into those trust funds. And those people who are related to the right people can also apply for Title II disability benefits. All three of the Title II disability programs require that the person goes through a five-step what Social Security calls sequential evaluation. And that sequential evaluation is all about working. It's only five questions and three of them are about working. Only one of the questions is about your disability. So the, the, these benefits are not, oh, I get them because I have a disability. You get them because your disability impacts your ability to earn substantial gainful activity or above. Title II disability benefits come with Medicare, Meta C A R E. So um, the feds and all their wisdom named the two programs, Medicaid and Medicare, almost the same. So it's, but it, they're very different programs. So Medicare comes after a 24 month waiting period. So social security determines that you're eligible for a benefit and then depending on which benefit you get, you might have to wait five months for the cash benefit to start. Um, but whenever your cash benefit is, is set to start, that begins your waiting period for your Medicare. So there is a two-year period typically. Now, some people will get on Title II disability benefits and get their Medicare right away. And why is that? Because it's taken so long for Social Security to process their application that they've actually passed through that entire two-year waiting period. Medicare is not a free insurance program. It uh, can be quite expensive, actually. 
there is a way for people who are of extremely low income to get some assistance with all or part of the costs of Medicare. That those programs are called the Medicare Savings Programs, and they're run by Texas Health and Human Services. So, it, But the person has to be extremely low income to qualify for a Medicare Savings Program. And there's a link where you can find out more about the Medicare Savings Programs of the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. The great thing about Medicare is that Social Security knows how important insurance is. And even if you lose your Title II cash benefit because of the money that you're earning from work, your Medicare will continue for many years. This is called the extended period of Medicare coverage. So a lot of folks say, well, I really don't care about the cash benefit, but I really care about my Medicare. Or if they're on supplemental security income, they care about their Medicaid. Well, Social Security knows that, and they've made sure that um, both Medicare and Medicaid continue even after you're not getting a cash benefit. People can get on Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI. That's for folks who have worked and paid into FICA or SICA, and they're able to draw that insurance benefit out off their own work record. And the younger somebody is, the sooner they could receive Social Security Disability Insurance. For example, someone who's under the age of 24 only needs six credits. That's a year and a half of work within the three-year period prior to Social Security determining that that person is disabled. That small amount of work will allow somebody to draw SSDI off their own work record. So this is just something for you to be aware of, because if you have children who receive supplemental security income who go to work, it is possible that eventually they will be moved over to Social Security Disability Insurance. If they lose their SSI and they're moved over to SSDI off their own work record, they could then lose their Medicaid as well. So these are all kind of just a little hint about those devilish details involved in these programs. Next slide, please. Sarah, um, can you just talk a little bit? We see this a few times a year. It's not very often that we see this, where a child may be, or a, an adult child might be getting some SSDI off of their own record, some childhood disability benefits off the parent's record, and some SSI, I know that that is kind of like one of those one-offs and it doesn't happen very often, but can you talk about how that could happen? It happens all the time. Um, and it's it, it's because it, when you get a received Title II, and I talk about this a little later, you're required to receive a certain, to be awarded a specific amount every month. If you don't receive that amount in Title II, then you'll get a little bit of SSI to make up so your, your awarded monthly amount of cash benefit reaches that required amount. Um, and you can draw two or even all three Title II disability insurance benefits. I've had customers who are a disabled widow widower who receive SSDI, and they're also a childhood disability beneficiary. They received all three Title II disability benefits. And it just depends on the amount of money coming off those different records. Um, so that's how that happens. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, to get the Title II cash benefit, you have to have earned a specific amount of money within a specific period and meet Social Security's requirements for disability. If the individual has enough credits from their own work record, like I said, they'll get Social Security Disability or SSDI. Okay, you can click and it should go to, there we go. Um, there are certain relatives, like I talked about, people, the right, if you're related to the right person, you can receive a Title II disability benefit. And we're gonna talk about one of those today in a little bit of detail, the childhood disability beneficiaries. These are also known as disabled adult children, or the acronym is CDB-DAC, okay? 
We can thank you. If you want to see any other family members, and there's many, many different ways family members can draw cash benefit off someone um, who's paid into these systems, uh, you can go to Social Security's Family Benefits uh, page, and that lists all the different ways that folks can receive, or different family members could receive a cash benefit off someone else's work record. Next slide. So there are three different types of Title II disability insurance benefits. There's Social Security Disability Insurance, that's for folks age 18 or older, up to retirement age, the full retirement age, who are drawing off their own work record. Then there's the Childhood Disability Beneficiaries, also known as Disabled Adult Child, the CDB DAX. They must be over age 18. Um, that CDB DAC benefit never converts to retirement. So it's age 18 to the end of life and they're drawing off a parent's work record. Now that is not to say that a CDB DAC might not start drawing SSDI off their own work record because they very well might. So they might be getting SSDI and CDB DAC at the same time. At some point, they might even transfer over to SSDI totally and not receive any more CDB DAC. Again, that happens based on the amount of earnings and the amount of uh, the insurance cash benefit that you're able to draw from Social Security. And the other, the final and third uh, disability insurance benefit is the disabled widow or widower beneficiary or DWIBs. These are folks who are age 50 to age 65 who are drawing off a deceased spouse's work record. Next slide. The thing about the Title II cash benefit, and I talk to a lot of families who say, I want to get my child onto SSDI or onto CDB DAC because they'll get so much more money than they get with supplemental security income. Well, neither Title II nor SSI are designed for people to be able to live off those ca monthly cash benefit amounts. That's not how the programs were designed. So it's very rare that someone can pay all their bills, even if they get a Title II retirement benefit. This year, uh, in 2024, the average Title II cash benefit is $1,537 a month. That's the average. And that's including for people who are retired who are getting $1,537. And again, some people get a lot more than that. Some people get a lot less than that. That's just the average amount. But you can see that that's not a living wage, right? So you can't really live off that amount of money in 2024 in the United States. Next slide. We had a um, brief question um, yep. in the chat box um, saying um, regarding the 24 month waiting period for Medicare, if the DAC has been on SSI for four years, wouldn't the waiting period be already earned? Some of the waiting period may be earned if they have been on SSI. Yes. Yes. So they still might have wait a 24, and... You still have a 24 month waiting period, but technically you may have already passed um, all or part of that waiting period. And is that depending on whether or not they were getting um, DAC, I mean, DAC benefits or CDB benefits under the parent re parents' record? Well, to get Medicare, you would have to get a Title II cash benefit. So it would depend on when Social Security determines the date of disability onset. That's, yeah, a technical answer, but that's the answer. Okay, the most important rule for Title II disability benefits to know when someone goes to work is that you either get the cash benefit or you get no cash benefit at all. So you either get the entire cash benefit that you're awarded, minus any overpayments you might be paying or other things that you might be paying out of that. But you either get that cash benefit or you get zero cash benefit. There's no gradual reduction of the cash benefit. It's all or nothing. Um, next slide. So as I said, you either get the whole thing or you get nothing at all. So how do you figure out what somebody's, is somebody eligible for a cash benefit or not. Um, 
And if you click on this, Allison, it'll go to the next part of the slide. So how you, you need to know three things to figure out whether someone's going to get a Title II cash benefit in a particular month. You have to first know what their monthly gross income is. You have to know what Title II return to work stage they are in. And we'll talk about those work stages for Title II. And you have to know if they might have any work incentives or deductions they can take um, that will lower their countable income for Social Security's purposes to below substantial gainful activity. Next slide. So let's talk about the childhood disability beneficiaries, also known as disabled adult children, The because um, that for most of you on the phone, um, this is probably why you're attending this to find out about the CDB DAX. Um, again, this is a Title II benefit, so it comes with Medicare. Uh, it can be awarded to people over the age of 18 whose disability occurred prior to the age of 22 and who have one or both parents who are drawing SSDI who are retired or they them or have passed away. So that's a criteria. If someone on CDB DAC has earned substantial gainful activity, that's at 1,550 gross a month for non-blind, 2,590 for blind in 2024. If they have earned substantial gainful activity after the age of 22, even if they only earned it in one month, they will not be eligible to get this benefit. Okay. Um, and that's that's just a, a way this program is designed. Another very important CDB DAC rule to know is that if a CDB DAC marries someone other than another Title II beneficiary, that would be somebody who receives Social Security Disability Insurance, or they might marry another CDB DAC, they could marry a disabled widow widower, or they could marry a retiree, because retirement is also a Title II benefit. It's not a disability benefit, but it is a Title II benefit. If a CDB, CDB DAC marries outside of that Title II group, they will be terminated from the CDB DAC cash benefit and Medicare immediately with no appeal rights. That is because the way this program was designed and CDB DACs, were, uh, the program was initiated in 1953. It was thought at that time that if you had a disability, your parents would have to take care of you your whole life. But if you got married, then the responsibility to take care of you shifts over to your spouse. Now, why can't they marry outside of the Title II group? It all has to do with where the money comes from for CDB DAGs, okay? If it happens that someone is terminated from the cash benefit in Medicare immediately because they married outside of the Title II group, they could apply for SSI um, and they may get it. Unfortunately, um, in vocational rehabilitation, we see uh, too often CDB DACs who have been terminated because they married outside of the Title II group. Um, and, you know, we, we tell parents this and, and oftentimes a parent will say, oh, don't worry, they'll never marry, they don't even date. Well, unfortunately, you may not be around forever and your child may go off and marry and date somebody, you know. Um, who's not a Title II ben beneficiary. So it is important to let your child know that if they're a CDB DAC and for you to be aware of it because it is a really quirky rule. Okay, next slide. Um, so <clears throat> one thing I want to talk about is um, the CDB DAC will not be awarded to someone who's earned um, over SGA at eight, uh, after age 22, even if the person has only earned SGA in one month. So we have heard this repeatedly over and over and over for, for many years, but um, recently a contact um, from the Social Security Administration said that because we were verifying this because we had someone that was close, it was questionable, we were looking at the DPQY and seeing that they had some, some times where they had some months that they had earned over the SGA. And what we were told, um, this is just last week, and so again, we can take this deeper and, and look deeper, but what we were told is that they wouldn't 
quote unquote, lose their um, DAC status or their CDB status unless they've earned over SGA more than that nine month trial work period is basically what they were saying. And so, um, so Sarah and I will take a deeper dive on this and kind of look into this further. This is just um, came up and we've had a few cases on this um, lately. And we've got a case um, in particular where the person had earned over SGA, but less than the nine months and still continues to be on the, the, the CDB uh, benefit. So I just wanted to mention that, um, but I do concur that this is what we've always heard even one month if they go over that SGA even um, even one month. But now they're saying that they have that trial work period to earn any of, any amount and as long as it's not past that nine months. So I just wanted to mention that. Well, once somebody gets on CDB DAC, they can earn over substantial gainful activity. So the person at Social Security was correct because they were awarded CDB DAC. Once you get on, you can earn over substantial gainful activity. It's trying to, when you apply for it, you can't apply and have earned um, above SGA. But once okay, they get um, on, sure, they can earn above SGA. Yeah, they can. Once okay, they get so um, one person says, in bullet three, if someone already has CDB DAC SSDI and is working and on phase one, if they earn over SGA for the month, does that remove the SSA uh, CDB DAC for the rest of their lives? I think that that, I think you answered no, that. No, it if you does not. To... If the person is, and this bullet says it will not be awarded to someone. Someone who's already been awarded CB DAC, CDB DAC can make as much money as they want in those nine months, which we'll talk about in just a second. Yeah. And I have one more question because I, I want to talk about this um, a little bit further. So a lot of times when we're applying, initially what we're applying for is SSI and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. But when we're applying, we're also establishing that the child's disability started prior to age 22. So they have disabled adult child status basically in the system but mom or dad hasn't turned on their social security or social security retirement. So in the example that CDB benefits aren't necessarily being paid out yet to said individual, but their status is disabled adult child. And I mean, like they have qualified that the qualifying disability prior to age 22, how would that work? I'm not sure what your, uh, I mean, you can be, SSI has different categories than Title II. You can be a disabled child and receive SSI. Um, so you're, you, I mean, you have to apply. I, I guess what I'm asking is if they've already been established as an individual whose disability started prior to age 22, Okay. even if their benefits, CDB benefits aren't on yet because mom or dad isn't retired or disabled, uh -huh. And and that example, would they still be okay because their status has been already established as as eligible for for childhood disability benefits? No, they still have to apply for childhood disability benefits. It's not automatic. So yeah, you still have to go through the application. You're still going to have to submit medical records. You're still going to have to do all of that when you apply. Yeah. Okay. One more question, and then we're going to move on. Um, are CDB DAC benefits always disregarded? for Medicaid income counting purposes? I'm not even sure what that question is. So uh, Medicaid income counting, don't know what that means. Um, my, so there's a such thing as unearned income and earned income for Medicaid counting purposes mm -hmm. and all income for our SSI, SSDI, childhood disability benefits are income Oh, um, I for see. Purposes yeah, of, no, of Medicaid. Not, they, no. they are going to be counted. There's very, very few things that aren't no. counted, like rail, railroad benefits, um, but it is it is counted. Yeah, HHSC, the Health and Human Service Commission, which runs Medicaid, gives childhood disability beneficiaries, disabled adult children, um, a deduction when they become a CDB DAC. So you just have to get in touch with HHSC and ask them what their deduction is, and they'll let them know. And, and someone said that, that the income requirements for, and, and what they're talking about is Medicaid waivers, that right. the, the right. and they will 300% of SSI, mm -hmm. which is 28, 29, 
mm-hmm. per month. So as long as their income from all sources is less than the twenty eight twenty nine, then they still maintain their eligibility for any of the Medicaid waivers. So that is correct. So even if someone was on supplemental security income in Medicaid and they became a CDB DAC and lost that SSI in Medicaid, they can still get Medicaid. Um, to continue to receive that Medicaid, they have to apply using Texas's Health and Human Services H-1200 form, but they will get it um, if they were receiving SSI in the month prior to becoming a CDB DAC. Okay, if you can click on that. Okay. Um, if you transition to CDB DAC, and we get this question a lot, you will, and you're on a home and community based service waiver, like HCS, Texas Home Living, Glass, et cetera, you will not lose that waiver. Okay. Even if you've lost the SSI Medicaid, you're still continuing to get Medicaid by virtue of getting the waiver services. Uh, you can apply for what they call continuing state plan Medicaid by using that H-1200 form. Next slide. So if you never received supplemental security income and the Medicaid associated with SSI, you are not automatically eligible for Medicaid. That last slide that I said was only for those who had received SSI and Medicaid in the month prior to becoming a CDB DAC. They can have continuing state plan Medicaid. But some people who never received SSI will still get some SSI. And that's what we were talking about earlier. The amount, there's a specific amount that everyone who gets any Title II benefit must be awarded. This year, that amount is $963. So if someone was never on SSI um, and their parent retires or passes away or themselves becomes disabled and their child, their adult child, <clears throat> who's over the age of 18, whose disability occurred prior to the age of 22, draws a cash benefit off that parent's work record um, and they draw $700, then the person's going to get some SSI to make up for that lack of, of that financial award. So that if the person gets $700 in CDB DAC, they're going to get $263 in supplemental security income. Uh, and that brings that total monthly cash benefit up to the required amount of 963 But because in Texas, SSI automatically comes with Medicaid, that person will also get Medicaid, which is great. Okay, so they'll have total wraparound health insurance with the Medicaid and Medicare. Next slide. One thing I want to mention here that it is important, I mean, the way you apply and when you turn on your own Social Security retirement benefits, sometimes people are thinking about turning on their Social Security retirement benefits and their child is about to turn 18 or hasn't turned 18 yet. And so to Sarah's point, it's, the path is SSI and Medicaid first, getting them approved for SSI and Medicaid first, even if that means that you have to wait to turn on your Social Security retirement, that's what's going to give them that path and allow them to keep that Medicaid. So as far as when you turn your benefits on, it really matters and you really do need to be strategic this way. Um, the other thing I wanted you to talk about, because I know that we've seen issues, everybody's seen issues with this, of, you know, which comes first and whose job is this? Um, as, as far as it is it the Social Security Administration's job, they're supposed to make this little tick mark on my kid's case and they're automatically supposed to say approved for Medicaid. We've seen that happen where nobody needed to reapply for Medicaid. We've seen it not happen and people actually had to submit a new application and there's a lack of consistency in our state and the state of Texas and I know we have people you know attend from out of state but can you can you talk about that like when that person was getting SSI mom or dad turned on their retirement benefits and the kid is switching over to childhood disability benefits and then mom or dad gets a letter saying your Medicaid is canceled and we go into pure panic Tell, tell us about that and what to do if that happens. Well, that's when you, you get out the HHSC form H-1200 and apply for that continuing state plan Medicaid. And you want to be sure if you're using 
the HHSCH1200 form to get that continuing state plan Medicaid as a CDB DAC that you write on the top of every page of that application in big red letters, DAC, D-A-C. Um, and that tells the HHSC workers that this is a, uh, a CDB DAC. And CDB DACs, again, who received SSI and Medicaid prior to becoming a CDB DAC cannot be turned down for continuing state plan Medicaid. They, they are required uh, to get that continuing Medicaid by federal law. Okay, next slide. <laughs> or we don't seem to be going to the night. There we go. And then there's the disabled widow, widower beneficiary. Again, we're not going to go into any detail about these because I don't believe anybody on the call is interested in these folks. But these are folks who are at least 50, but not yet 65. They have a disability. Their spouse passed away. Um, and they may be able to draw a benefit from their deceased spouse's work record. They also can get that continuing state plan Medicaid if they received SSI in the month prior to becoming a disabled widow, widow, or beneficiary. Next slide. Um, Sarah, I just want to mention here that in this example, you know, sometimes it is possible that the kid could not qualify for SSI per first um, because the parent was already disabled or because there was a parent that was deceased. Are you aware of any rules um, that would protect their Medicaid eligibility for anybody that falls into that category if they had um a deceased parent or, you know, basically the parent was already on disability benefits. There was no matter of I can wait a few more months to turn my retirement on. Are there any other caveats for that, that category of people? No, but I mean, if the person was receiving Medicaid um, <clears throat> at, by virtue of getting SSI, then they could still get that continuing Medicaid. Um, if they never received Medicaid, though, they never received it, then, you know, there are a lot of different ways to get Medicaid. It's not just SSI. That's just the main one we know about. But there's lots of other ways to get Medicaid. Um, they may qualify for another Medicaid program. That's possible. Or, you know, that their cash benefit may be low enough so that they will get some SSI and Medicaid. But there's a lot of different sure. ways and to get on Medicaid. There's a lot of stuff um, going on back and forth in the chat box. And one of the things that I want to make um, really clear is there are a lot of Medicaid programs in every single state. And the Medicaid waiver programs and SSI Medicaid and their requirements are different. And so it's very, very confusing on, you know, okay, so for this Medicaid, I, I can do this. Yes. Or over here, you look at mm -hmm. like 300% of SSI income for Medicaid waivers, but that's not at all the income requirements for regular Medicaid. So it's very, very be, um, careful. You've got to be careful in which program you're looking at and how it is applied and understanding how Health and Human Services has your child labeled. Are they labeled CDB DAC? Um, it, it is possible that the Health and Human Services has the Medicaid label incorrect. So um, is there a way that, you know, is it just contacting Health and Human Services to find out, um, you know, which Medicaid program they're under, if it's specifically a waiver or SSI Medicaid, what have you? Sure. Um, Texas has a Medicaid hotline that uh, you can call that sometimes can be a little more helpful than 211. So that would be the line that I would call. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but you can just Google Texas Medicaid hotline or helpline and that number will come up. And that's the way you can find out how does my child receive Medicaid because it it may not be readily apparent. There's even something now called modified adjusted gross income Medicaid. So if the family makes a little too much money, the child can still get Medicaid. So it's, you know, and just remember when we're talking about social security and we're talking about Medicaid, we're talking about two entirely different programs with entirely different rules. They do interact and intersect with each other, but you have to understand the rules 
for the Medicaid, and then you have to understand the rules for your social security disability benefits separately, and then you have to layer them together. And none of this is easy. There is some help with this, and I'll tell you who can help um, a little later on. But let's get into like how you actually work, how you get to work <laughs> um, when you're on Title II. There are five different stages of work that you can use, whether you get a cash benefit or you don't, depends on which stage of work you're in and how much you're earning within that stage of work. Uh, everybody just gets one set of these five stages of work. And that means you might have used, someone might have used one of their stages of work a long time ago and not even be aware of it. Next slide. And we're going to talk about what the five stages of work actually are. They are the trial work period, the extended period of eligibility, the cessation and grace period, expedited reinstatement, and the initial reinstatement period. And this, as I said, is going to be an extremely broad overview of these five stages of work. So if you go to the next slide, please, we'll talk about the trial work period. This is a time where folks can try working. During the trial work period, they can make as much money as they possibly can make, and they will still get their Title II cash benefit during this time. Uh, trial work is made up of nine months uh, within what they call a rolling 60-month period. The nine months don't have to be consecutively used, and the period is a rolling 60-month period. And I'm not going to go into this because it is complicated to explain, but it's not a finite five-year period. It is a rolling 60-month period. Um, <clears throat> for each month that you earn above a certain amount of money, you've used a trial work period month. The amount of gross earned income that tells Social Security that you've used a trial work period month in 2024 is $1,110 or above. And remember, that amount can change every January 1st. But this is nine months that the person can try working, see how much they can earn. Um, can they physically do this mentally? Do they have the stamina to, to work this amount of time? If they don't, then they can drop their hours or um, quit the job. But this is the time to really try working. A lot of people will say, well, then I'm going to save my trial work period. And we say, no, this is really the time to try. Um, you don't need to save this trial work period. You can use it. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Try working. Next slide. The second- I to talk about, um, we, have a, um, we had a question. So we talked about SGA earlier, the 1550 yes. gross uh -huh. earnings yes. um, per month. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about this trial work month. So yes. basically, if they earn $1,110 or more, it counts as a trial work month. Um, the, the person says, clarifying question, if my child is a dad, he can earn up to $1,500 after nine months. There's no cap after that. Can you, can you no, go back during, and, and yes, talk about that? During during the nine month trial work period, your child can earn as much as they want every single month. And they're still eligible for their Title II cash benefit in that month. The amount of money, amount of earnings that tells Social Security you've used a trial work period month is $1,110. That changes when we get to the second stage, which is the extended period of eligibility. This period starts after the ninth trial work period month is completed, and it lasts for three years. It does run consecutively. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do, whether you work or don't work. The extended period of eligibility is going to run for those three years, 36 months consecutively, once you've completed all nine months of your trial work period. During the extended period of eligibility, this is where substantial gainful activity becomes important to that mom who just said, so what's the 1,550? That substantial gainful activity is important during the extended period of eligibility. Any month during the extended period of eligibility in which you earn substantial gainful activity or above, you are not eligible for a cash benefit in that month if you're earning substantial gainful activity or above. 
any month during this 36 uh, month extended period of eligibility that you make under substantial gainful activity, you are eligible for the cash benefit in that month. This is where you see overpayments happen because Social Security often doesn't record the earnings that people are reporting and they continue to send the cash benefit and people just cash it because they think, well, they sent it to me. I guess I, I get it, right? I'm eligible for it, but you may not be. So it's up to you to track your phases of work, your stages of work during Title II. So it's up to you to track your trial work period. It's up to you to track your extended period of eligibility so that you know which months you are eligible or not eligible for that cash benefit. Now, the third stage of work, if we go to the next slide, is called the cessation grace period. And that third stage of work is very confusing because I just told you that any time during the extended period of eligibility, if you earn above substantial gainful activity, no cash benefit. Well, I kind of lied because you do have this stage, which is the cessation grace period. The very first time after a all nine months of a trial work period have been completed. The first time you earn above substantial gainful activity, you're not technically eligible for a cash benefit, but Social Security is going to give you one for three months. Um, and it can happen, this cessation grace period can happen during the extended period of eligibility, but you may not make substantial gainful activity during that 36 month extended period of eligibility. If you don't, then you have your three month cessation grace period available after the extended period of eligibility ends, or you may never make above substantial gainful activity in your lifetime, and then you won't ever trigger this three month cessation grace period. Um, this is a, just the cessation grace period was put into place by Social Security to help them with their own bookkeeping because the Title II cash benefits do run about three months behind. And there was a time when Social Security could catch up with their bookkeeping, but now that's no longer true. But so basically you have your nine trial work period months in which you can earn any amount of money. And then you have your three month cessation grace period in which you can earn any amount of money and still get your cash benefit. So altogether, you have 12 months there, an entire year when you're on a Title II benefit to earn as much as you possibly can and continue to get that cash benefit. Okay, next slide. Sarah, Once let's talk about um, the BPQY. Um, sometimes you guys are reporting the earnings of your, of your child and they're not, sometimes they're getting recorded, sometimes they're getting recorded in, incorrectly. Um, sometimes they're not getting recorded at all. And there is something that you can request for free, the benefits query, a BPQY. I'll put that in the chat box. If you're wondering, like, how many trial work months have we already used? Um, like, you know, what does the Social Security Administration say about said child and their benefits and what they have? You can request that BPQY and check that against the records that you've submitted. If there's any errors, then you can request that those be um, corrected, but I think it is important to see what they have on file and for your loved one. I know that when we requested our BPQY, we um, found out that all of the wages that we had been reporting for four years had never been recorded. Although they had them, they had never been recorded. So it was a really good exercise and we really did need to get it corrected. And on our BQ BPQY, it said we had zero months used of our nine month trial work period when in fact we were almost done with our, you know, nine month trial work period. So I think that that's a really good place to, um, to check out if you haven't done it already. Um, let me just say to the parents who are listening, um, the benefits planning query is only free if you uh, let Social Security know that you need it because you are going to return to work. Social Security can charge you for a benefits planning query. Um, and the benefits planning query is incorrect about at least 50% of the time. So you have to understand, you know, what's supposed to be on there. And like Allison said, if you know your child has used 
um, their trial work period, and that's blank, the thing that you want to look for is under the section called SSDI, Work Activity on the Benefits Planning Query, you want to look at the date of the last work review action. And then you want to also look to see on the benefits planning query if there are posted verified yearly earnings listed. And if there aren't, Social Security does not know your child is working. Um, even though you've reported it, you may have to ask them to initiate a work review. Okay? So... If you are terminated, once you uh, come out of your extended period of eligibility, that 36-month consecutive period, once you earn above substantial gainful activity, your cash benefits will be terminated. Um, and that's terminated. It's no more get, get a cash benefit or don't get a cash benefit, depending on how much you earn. You are terminated um, from the cash benefits. But remember that Medicare is continuing for a very, very long time. And the really great thing about Title II is there's a really easy way to get back onto benefits very quickly. If you stop working or your earnings drop below substantial gainful activity. And that's called expedited reinstatement. Um, you can file for expedited reinstatement for, you have five years from the month the cash benefit was terminated to file for expedited reinstatement. And Social Security will give you six cash benefits, six months of cash benefits while they redetermine whether the disability on which you were originally awarded benefits has medically improved or not. If they determine the disability is not medically improved, then the cash benefits will just keep on coming in. And remember, your Medicare has never stopped. That's continued to run this entire time, even after your cash benefits were actually terminated. Um, if by some chance you, you're disability has medically improved, and wouldn't that be a great thing? Then um, you don't have to pay back the six months of cash benefits that Social Security gave you. Uh, and unfortunately, less than one half of 1% of all the people who file for expedited reinstatement are determined medically improved. So uh, if you find that you cannot sustain work uh, at the amount that you were making and you have to drop your hours, that drops you below SGA, or maybe you lose the job entirely for whatever reason, you can get back on Title II benefits very quickly using expedited reinstatement. And then you go into, next slide, the fifth and final stage of work, which is called the initial reinstatement period. Once you have used expedited reinstatement to successfully get back on benefits, you trigger this uh, IRP or initial reinstatement period. During the IRP, any month, it's kind of like that extended period of eligibility, any month in which you earn above substantial gainful activity, you are not eligible for the cash benefit. If you are an under SGA, you are eligible for the cash benefit during this initial reinstatement period. Once you've received 24 months of cash benefits, and that 24 months does not have to be consecutive, it could take you 10 years to get 24 months of cash benefits if you continue to work a little bit here and there. Um, but once you receive 24 months of cash benefits, you get an entirely new group of work of uh, stages of work. You get a new trial work period, you get a new extended period of eligibility, new cessation grace, possibly a new ex expedited reinstatement and initial reinstatement period. So you're in what Social Security calls a new period of disability at that point. And so that's why you get all these stages of work over again. Okay, next slide. Can we talk about this last slide? I um, just have a question here because you talked about them being um, eligible again for SSDI, but I want to clarify in the example that their loved one has lost their DAC status, or, or it was called DAC for 40 years, and they, then they changed it to CDB, but the terms are kind of synonymous. Um, once they've lost their CDB status, if they're determined to be disabled again, would that disability be under their own record? They Or could they ever regain their DAC status, or not so much? 
Um, probably not if they've gone, if they've gotten to this stage, because it would mean that they've earned enough that they qualify for social security disability insurance off their own work record. That's not a bad thing. I mean, the, all the rules are the same for social security disability insurance in terms of working as they are for a CDB DAC. And the benefit is, hey, you could marry anybody you want if you get SSDI. You don't have to marry <laughs> within Title II. So there are some upsides to that. And the other upside is that if you get SSDI off your own work record, well, then you can get retirement. And once you reach retirement, none of these rules apply. You don't have to report things. You don't have to worry about how much you're earning. Um, so there could be a benefit to that, actually. Right? Thank you. Sure. Um, there are two work incentives that you can use after the completion of the trial work period to bring your countable earned income to below substantial gainful activity for social securities purposes, okay? These are the impairment related work expense and subsidy special condition. Next slide. So the impairment related work expense is the first one and that's an item or service that you need to maintain that job related to the disability. You have to apply and request for the IRWI and have it approved before you use it. Um, and again, you use any of these uh, two work incentives, impairment related work expense or subsidy special condition after you have completed a trial work period when you know you're going to be earning above substantial gainful activity. So let's look at an example of an impairment related work expense and how it applies in the next slide. Melanie receives $1,000 in SSDI. Uh, she earns $1,600 a month. She's completed her trial work period because her gross income is above SGA, above that $1,550. If she doesn't have um, a work incentive, she's gonna trigger her three month cessation grace period and then her Title II cash benefit would be suspended. But Melanie has expenses. She spends money for paratransit to get to and from work. She has co-pays on her doctor's visits and co-pays for her medications. She has an iPhone, which she has to have to communicate with her employer and other coworkers. And those are all Irwies, and she spends $350 a month. So what we do in Title II is we take the entire $350 in impairment-related work expenses away from her $1,600 gross income, that drops her countable earned income to $1,250 in the social security world. That's below SGA and Melanie continues to receive her $1,000 SSDI cash benefit as well as her earnings above SGA. The next work incentive is called a subsidy special condition. And a subsidy is when the person with a disability doesn't do all the tasks normally required for a job. Um, they get either extra time to do the tasks or maybe the employer helps them, has a coworker work with them. Uh, and But the employer is paying the same wages to that person who's not doing 100% of the job. Uh, as they do people without disabilities. A special condition is when someone else pays for uh, help on the job. Typically a special condition is a job coach. It could be other things, but it's typically a job coach uh, who's paid for through an HHSC home and community-based waiver or my agency vocational rehabilitation can pay for job skills trainers for limited periods of time. And that could be a special condition. And again, you use subsidy and special condition after you've completed a trial work period and when your earnings are going to be above substantial gainful activity for the month. So let's look first at an example of a subsidy. Um, Paul uh, receives $1,800. He's a CDB DAC and he earns above SGA $1,600. He's completed his trial work period. So if he doesn't have um, a work incentive, he's going to trigger his three month cessation grace and lose his, uh, then not be eligible for the cash benefit during his extended period of eligibility. But Paul needs additional time to learn new tasks. The supervisor physically demonstrates them and then he texts those steps to Paul. That would be a subsidy. And there's a formula that's used to figure out subsidy that we're not gonna go into today, but there's a specific formula that you can figure out what percentage of subsidy. In Paul's case, it's 25%. He does his productivity le levels at 75% in comparison to other people doing 
quote, 100% productivity. And when we use that formula, that translates into $400 in uh, subsidy, and that lowers his gross earned income for Social Security's purposes to below SGA. And here's an example of a special condition. It's Paul, again, and he has a job coach who's paid for through HCS, Home and Community-Based Waiver. He gets uh, 10 hours a week of job coaching. So we take his salary, which is $9.50 an hour, multiply it times 10 hours of the job coaching he gets, and then we multiply that times 4.333, because that's what Social Security uses to figure out estimated um, earnings or amounts for any month. And we get $411 in special conditions, and that $411 lowers his countable earned income to below SGA. So Paul continues to receive his CDB debt cash benefit of $1,800 and his earnings of $1,600. So that's one way you can use work incentives. Um, there is help with benefits counseling. You can call the Ticket to Work helpline and if they you they will refer you to a free certified by Social Security benefits counselor. You have to be working or be self-employed or have a job offer pending or are beginning your self-employment if you're going into self-employment. And they will want, if you're going to do self-employment, they have to have a projected profit and loss statement for the first year and an approved business plan. Um, you can also get this free benefits counseling if you're age 18 or younger and still receiving benefits under the childhood definition of disability. That would be supplemental security income. If your child is a customer of the agency that I work for, Vocational Rehabilitation Services, you will receive free expert benefits counseling as a part of your vocational rehabilitation services. Okay. And then if you're thinking, well, maybe after she said all this, maybe my child might be able to go to work. Yeah, here's what Title II is in a nutshell. It works in stages. There are lots of safety nets. In many years, you can try working and still be attached to the system. Even if you're terminated from cash benefits, you can get back onto the system very quickly using expedited reinstatement. And Medicare continues as long as you're getting a cash benefit. And even after that cash benefit has been terminated, Medicare continues for many, many years. If you're interested in pursuing employment or you um, would like some help, with uh, your child getting employment. That's who we are. That's what Vocational Rehabilitation Services is about. Um, our services are really are anything someone needs to succeed in their employment goal. That can include, we sponsor folks to go to college. We sponsor folks to go to apprenticeship programs. We provide vocational and occupational skills training. We do career planning assessment. We can provide job developers and job coaches for time limited. Our services are time limited. When somebody becomes employed, we follow them along for a short period of time and then close their case because our job is to get you into employment and get you stable and, uh, and working for a period of time. And then we close the case. But you can come back to vocational rehabilitation as many times as you need to in your lifetime. Things change. Um, you don't like the job you have. You want another job. You want to advance in your career. You can come back to us. We also offer something called pre-employment transition services to folks who are 14 to 22. Um, and you don't have to be a customer of ours to receive pre-employment transition services. And there is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me um, with any questions you might have. Thank you, Allison. Um, thank, thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a lot of great information. I know every time we talk about this topic, it's a little overwhelming. Lots of good questions um, came out, so thanks for putting your questions in the chat box. Um, anyone who um, uh, joined uh, after the beginning announcements, um, this is being recorded. You are going to get an email with a link to the recording and a copy of today's slides. So if you have any questions, uh, certainly reach out. Um, thank you for being here with us again, Sarah. Always really, really great information. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. And we hope everyone has a great afternoon. Take care.